Corey Johnson from New York. I'm in for Emily Chang. And this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, coming up, Snap's disappearing return. Shares of Snap are in free fall at after hours trading after a crummy earnings report. We're going to break it down. Plus, Waymo's turning point, Alphabet's self-driving unit close to chauffeuring people in minivans without human backup drivers. We're going to progress report from CEO John Krafchick. And Congress continues to make the case for holding big tech more accountable. We're going to talk about the efforts to hold Internet companies legally liable for the content on their platforms. But first in the lead, Snap out with disappointing third quarter results. The company still isn't meeting. Well, who cares about the analyst projections? The analysts are always wrong anyway. But the users' numbers, really bad. Uh, daily average users, 178 million, less than 180 million, the analyst estimates. Like I said, they're always wrong. Uh, ad prices uh, are looking weak. Shares tumbling after these results down, as I mentioned, uh, down at freefall. 17% decline. Over 24% of them afloat was, stock, uh, was short. So a lot of people were expecting this. But the only analysts we want to hear... James Chalkmock, right here from Ones Crespi Hart. Good to see you, James, as always. Um, uh, I'm sorry to diss your analyst. Yeah, Brevin, but no, you like I'm me? sitting right here. Well, I mean, look, uh, sell-side sell analysts get these things wrong. Sure. Buy-side looks like they got it right because they were short the stock. 24% of the float uh, was short going into the quarter. Um, these numbers are weak. I mean, in fairness, you know, when you look at the color commentary around the the headwinds in 3Q and the difficult comp, you could have arrived at the number that they posted. But I think what the street had was some benefit of the doubt in trying to give them uh, some hope uh, that engagement from some of these new f features are going better. But I think the takeaway is that when you look at the Facebook Google duopoly, there's absolutely no silver bullet, even if you have 178 million followers. Well, all right, so we got 178 million or followers, daily users, um, uh, yeah. daily uh, daily active users, uh, yeah. which is which is a lot of people, mm -hmm. but nothing compared to Twitter, and even an a, 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 a infinitesimal amount compared to Facebook, which is relevant. It's also a lot less than Instagram and Instagram mm -hmm. stories. We don't get quarterly numbers or monthly numbers or, or, or quarterly numbers from from Instagram. But last report, I think we had 300 million in Instagram is using Instagram stories. This 178 percent. Uh, 78 million users from a percentage uh, effect, just 2.9% uh, growth uh, on a sequential basis. That's weak. I'll say it's not great, but at the same time, you have to think about that they have so much opportunity to engage these users. You, they have all these publishers trying to uh, forge relationships with them. You know, it's it is more raw content, and there's a discovery aspect that I think is not there with the ephemeral nature of the service. That's not really there with other services. But the biggest issue is that Snap has all these users, all this engagement, and I think that they are their number one worst enemy. It's not Facebook, it's not Google, it's rather they are not effectively capitalizing and monetizing on the engagement and the users that they do have. And well, I think that's you can draw that same parallel to Twitter. They're losing money on every sale. Now, we don't think of it as a sale, but they've got negative gross margins. Again, I mean, negative gross margins, yeah. not negative operating margins, sure. right? The, the negative gross margins. It costs them more to deliver dancing hot dogs than they get in revenue from dancing hot dogs before they have any costs for staff or R&D or just, and, and their hosting costs, which they break yeah. out, which they thankfully break out in, in the release, and I commend them on that. Their hosting costs went way up again. I mean, look, there are areas of criticism that I give you credit for criticizing, but on the hosting side, I, I, I think I don't think that's quite fair because I mean they're well, putting. It was, it was 88 cents uh, from right, but at the same time, the the opportunity is if the business did scale in the way it was supposed to, you know, you were going to see a much steeper leverage trajectory uh, than what you see now. The if issue I is that the way I was supposed to be starting in the NBA, <laughs> but it didn't work out that way. I'm sitting here with but you. The I mean, issue is this on business revenue, isn't working. not on the cost. But I mean, this well. If the, if, to your point, if the revenue was growing, we wouldn't be talking about these costs so much. <laughs> but they're rising costs per user, right. buck eighteen per user. Uh, that's my calculation. I think that's the same number they arrive at, um, which is much the case with these companies. Yeah. Uh, that number is way up from the eighty-four mm -hmm. cents last time. I mean, that's another. You know, there's no, there seems to be no scale to this business. You'd think once they got over a hundred million users, the costs would kind of fall off and they could continue to provide this service. But I, I guess with these filters and the, stuff, that are, it's just costing more to do. There's, it. there's no scale because revenue, the the 
the the moderation in the growth curve is is a lot steeper downward than than you would like to see. I mean, look at the ARPU number. It was a dollar seventeen this quarter, right. up thirty nine percent from last year. That's a number that should be growing in the triple digits because you're so much lower. It was up from eighty four cents last year. I mean, that's that's about thirty five. Just back then, math about thirty five percent year over year. That ain't bad. It's not great because you're so early in the growth curve. These numbers need to be posting at a bare minimum in the triple-digit territory. The one time I try to say something nice, you say that that's the one <laughs> thing that's bad. Uh, so back to your duopoly thing. Yeah. You know, I was, I've was i been thinking a lot about Time, Inc., where I started my career uh, in the magazine business. Um, I worked for this great guy named Gil Rogan, who actually passed away yesterday, sadly. Um, he, one of his claims to fame was putting out a 584-page issue, issue of Sports Illustrated previewing the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Sports Illustrated now no longer chock full of ads. It's this tiny little thing. Ad dollars aren't going to magazines, but they also aren't going to Snap and Twitter. They're going to Facebook and Google, and it seems like Facebook and Google almost alone. I think not only are you seeing them taking the lion's share of the dollars, but at the same time, I think the things that the Amazon effect is also potentially shrinking the overall advertising pie because you're not seeing these big brands uh, advertise as much as they need to because it's going to well, private label. And then you think about the three biggest advertisers are finance, auto, and consumer packaged goods. Consumer packaged goods is going to private label, auto is going to self-driving, and then financial services is being disintermediated as well. So when you think about the biggest categories, you know, changing their structure, changing structurally, right. the, if the the pie is shrinking, and then out of the smaller pie, Facebook and Google are getting a greater and greater share. There's also, you know, talk about shooting themselves in their own foot. They still can't get around the problems on Android. Mm -hmm. Most smartphones in the world are Android phones. And they don't have a, a they don't they have technological problems to put it kindly providing Snapchat yeah. on uh, the, those phones. I mean, look, a lot of almost all the problems I would argue are self-inflicted. You know, like the Android issue. Right. You know, that should be done. They have a great search functionality, but people don't know about it. The Maps feature I think is very interesting, but they people don't know about it. Maybe this new f ad for or this new app format that they're rolling out will start to fix a lot of these things because their strengths aren't being showcased and aren't people aren't even aware of them. And well, that's and a big issue. Last one I'll throw out there. Yeah. For all the the fawning press they got over those stupid glasses. Buried in the I press release. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> point. Exactly my point. Who wouldn't want to own those glasses besides you? Nobody. Forty million dollar write off in the quarter for those glasses. Worthless. Forty million dollars of worthless inventory that I think anyone could probably have predicted. I mean, so like, for you, who loves the glass. Do you really wear I, I those? No, I don't. I bought them for research purposes. But uh, but the thing is, it's actually quite entertaining to use the whole circular video format. Like it, it was a new and different experience. If they you know, capitalize on that, and then maybe there was an opportunity there, but it was just the resources weren't put behind it in the way it needed to be. James Schockmark, always a great analysis, great work uh, from Ones Crespi Hart. Uh, they're lucky to have you. Thanks Thank a lot. you. All right, well, coming up, Alphabet's Waymo is taking another big step in the autonomous driving space. We're going to hear from John Kraftchik. This is Bloomberg. Did you see what happened to shares of Blue Apron today? The stock was down more than 20% today, hit a record low after the CEO talked to an investor conference and said that there were some concerns about profit margins at their newest fulfillment center. Not too fulfilling at all. Blue Apron reported results last week. Barclays analyst uh, Ross Sandler downgraded the stock, lowered the price to three bucks, but uh, Blue Apron having all kinds of problems out of the kitchen. Our right, well, Alphabet self-driving car unit has been making progress in the last few years and just hit a new milestone, Waymo, it's called Waymo. They've announced that they're going to start chauffeuring people around in minivans without the, quote, safety drivers. That means the staffers who are there to make sure nothing goes wrong. The company first started testing out this actual autonomous service in Phoenix. Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Bergen sat down with the Waymo CEO, John Kraftchik, at the Lisbon Web Summit, and they talked about the company's progress in tech driving tech. Take a listen. 
We've been at this a very long time. Um, it's been more than eight years at Waymo, um, working on fully self-driving cars. We've learned that experience is the best teacher. Um, over those eight years, we've driven 3.5 million miles autonomously across more than 20 US cities. Um, we've been learning an awful lot, as you know, in the virtual world, where we've now driven uh, mm -hmm. over 2.5 billion miles just last year. Um, and now we're to the point where we're driving really 10,000 miles on a daily basis autonomously in the cities in which we're testing, and 10 million miles every day um, representing driving of 25,000 cars um, every hour of every day. Um, so we've gotten to the point of, of confidence, and um, that confidence allowed us to go forward um, internally with, with what we just showed the world today um, in Phoenix, Arizona. And you've been test testing this with your early rider program volunteers in Phoenix uh, for, for almost five months now, I think. Uh, talk to me, how, how's that program going? You know, what are participants like? What, what has been you know, the major lesson you've taken away? Yeah, yeah. So we started our early rider program um, earlier this year in spring. Um, you know, the first signal that um, we had something special here was the overwhelming demand. We talked about um, the possibility that these folks could help define the future of mobility. We had over 10,000 applications to join the program within the first 24 hours. Um, and you know, right now we're in this position where there's a lot more demand for seats in our cars than than we can mm -hmm. actually provide, which isn't a bad problem to have. But we're learning a lot from these guys, right? We're learning about the intricacies of pickups and drop-offs. Um, they've helped us refine that in-car user interface and, and what we share with those users on the screen. They've helped us determine what the best way is to uh, alert them to the location of the start button, for example, in the, in the roof pod. Those sorts of things, um, just invaluable pieces of knowledge for our project mm -hmm. and for the engineers working at Waymo. So you said that the commercial service is coming soon. It's going to take the shape of a, of a ride hailing w w with a mobile app. Uh, it it sounds like you're not at the, the onsite working with, with Lyft, one of your partners. Uh, any reason for, for why not working with Lyft? Um, you know, we've got a lot of partners that we're working with in the space. Um, you mentioned mm -hmm. Lyft, we've got FCA who's working with us on the vehicle side, and AutoNation mm -hmm. and Avis to help us with maintenance and fleet management and those kinds of things. We'll, we'll share more about what we're doing with our good partner Lyft going forward. What we've talked about is we're going to help each other with the launch of, of new projects. So I'd say stay tuned for details on that one, Mark. Okay, sure. You, you also started testing uh, vehicles recently in, in Michigan to, to deal with snowy weather. Um, you know, talk about what, what, what are the next markets? Is it going to be a city like Phoenix, a suburban city that has pretty good nice weather? Or are, you, are you trying to take more, more challenging uh, areas next? Um, well, Phoenix is a, is a big place, um, and there's a lot of interesting and very challenging parts of Phoenix um, that we'll be driving in, including the downtown area, as, as we roll out our technology. Um, but I think it's a good bet to look at the places that we're testing right now and imagine that those will be likely next candidates for us to roll out uh, truly driverless capability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something about the, the truly driverless, which you've talked about in the past, is, is you are taking the driver out of the, the front seat. Um, you know, companies like Uber and Lyft employ a lot of drivers. I mean, what, what do you think about the, the impact on the jobs for, for driverless cars, and, and what responsibility will, will Waymo play there? Yeah, I think it's something that all of us in the space really need to think deeply about, um, for sure. Um, I mean, and I guess a, a couple of things to that point. Um, First is, we're adding a lot of jobs as we're developing this technology. Um, there are a lot of folks who we need, um, both with our partners, but also at Avis, Avis to, uh, uh, and at Waymo, to uh, maintain these vehicles, um, to work on our high technology and the LIDARs and the cameras and the radars. Um, so there's going to be a lot of skilled trades positions available at companies like Waymo in the future. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, Mark, is that for the most part, the people who are using our technology right now in Arizona um, are replacing personally driven miles anyway. And I think the, the great bulk of the miles that we're going to be driving as Waymo the driver um, will be replacing miles that folks like us would have driven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about a little bit, you, you mentioned you sort of hinted at that you're reimagining what a car, the inside of a car, will look like. Um, is, is that case, or you know, the, these vehicles maybe a few years from now won't necessarily look like they they do today? 
Well, just about every car that's ever been put out uh, to the world has been primarily designed for the driver, right, is the primary focal point. Um, it really does open up a lot of interesting possibilities when you imagine um, no specific driver other than Waymo as the driver, no human driver. Um, and we've we sort of taken our first shot at that with our little Fire, Firefly prototype. Um, mm -hmm. Going forward, yeah, Mark, we can imagine a lot of really interesting possibilities um, as we expand, and by we here I mean the collective we, um, all of us working in this space, um, as we expand to um, provide more and more applications and use cases for this technology, you can imagine the vehicles also becoming more specialized. Um, and you could so, uh, you know, imagine a vehicle that might be perfect for just one person. There's another vehicle that might work for a larger group of folks. Some might be designed with sleeping or napping in mind. Mm -hmm. um, some might be sort of food related cars that you take on your way to a venue. So possibilities there are truly endless in the future going forward. That was Waymo CEO John Krafchick talking to Bloomberg's Mark Bergen. Now we're coming up, investors have poured $11 billion into space ventures, the space space, if you will, since 2009. But uh, Jeff Bezos' funding of Blue Origin is very different. We're going to bring you the details on that next. This is Bloomberg. Well, the private race into space is heating up, but the billionaires on the mission are trying some different routes. No, all the spaceships are going to go straight up. There is that. But Jeff Bezos sold $4 billion in stock in Amazon in the past three years, and he's using most of that money to personally support his space company, Blue Origin. Different business model from what Elon Musk is trying at SpaceX or Richard Branson at Virgin Galactic. Both of those guys have undertaken outside funding to try to uh, quickly move in, in their space business and commercialize their operations. Joining me right now, Tom Metcalf from Bloomberg. Tom, good to see you. Hey. All right, do you live here now? I do now. I haven't now seen you. I used to be in San Francisco with me. Yeah. Uh, that would explain why I haven't seen you lately. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is really interesting that Jeff Bezos, who hasn't sold stock, uh, in Amazon for most of the time he's run Amazon, which is why he's one of the richest men in the world, because it's the value of his stock that gets him that way, is now selling stock to own a different enterprise. Yeah, and I think that kind of points to maybe, you know, Blue Origin truly is his, even more than Amazon, is like his absolute kind of passion project. And, and really, you know, he's in this unique position, even more so than Musk, who's a very rich man, even more so than Brunson, to basically go, you know what, I want complete control over this. And the way you do that is not having outside investors and um, also not necessarily chase, chasing revenue right at the start. Uh, and in, in, in the case of, of, of Branson and, and Musk, they've also accumulated their fortunes in very, it's, it, it, with all three characters, they've accumulated their fortunes in very different ways. You know, uh, uh, Bezos, as you mentioned, uh, he started in the hedge fund business, but he, you know, he made his money at Amazon by owning yeah. and keeping his Amazon shares. Uh, Elon Musk, selling shares in money losing businesses uh, long before they had any hope of success, whether it was uh, Tesla or, 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 or SpaceX or PayPal, even uh, when he worked there. Um, that was not yet a profitable business when he got out. Um, and so the accumulated losses for all those businesses is enormous. And Branson has just sort of sold off pieces of businesses for when he had to for regulatory reasons, like with, with uh, Virgin America or other things. But it, it, it does seem to follow their philosophy of bringing outside contributors uh, to the businesses and Bezos going it alone. Yeah, and I think part of that is simply like Bezos is in a better position than anyone else to, to fund it himself. I mean, as you pointed out, Amazon stock on an absolute tear. So basically, even though he's selling a billion dollars worth of stock, that's sort of a relatively small proportion of his holdings. I think. Well, it's Tesla stock until recently was on a tear as well, and, and Musk was certainly selling a lot of shares on the way up. No, and uh, well, the interesting thing there is what Musk is doing is pledging a lot of Tesla shares. And when we first started looking at this story, we're like, is he pledging shares to support SpaceX? And actually, he's, he was using the shares to support more Solar City before he brought it into Tesla. Uh, so it's kind of incredible if you think SpaceX, just because they've managed to build this business, is not necessarily kind of a, a sinkhole for money, apart from perhaps for outside investors. It does also. I mean, it's a, maybe it's my obsession as a former uh, hedge fund manager, but 
you know, it also reduces the flow to the stock if you've locked up shares and you're not loaning up to short sellers, which raises their cost of short selling, but also can suddenly reduce the float and suddenly cause someone to have to cover. Well, there you go. That's getting very technical for me. But I, well, I'm just, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, with the huge short interest in, 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 in Tesla, someone's getting paid just to hold the stock. We don't know if, if Musk is getting paid or not. He hasn't said anything about it, but it's, it, it's an interesting thing. How far along are these guys in, in their, uh, their efforts? It seems that uh, they're all making really uh, great progress in their efforts. Yeah, I, I think so. And I mean, SpaceX pretty much has been kind of an operational business for the last 10 years at least. Uh, and, you know, Blue Origin is main, making a lot of progress, but what it's not doing is trying to get customers yet and so maybe maybe next year they might send tourists up to space if they can get to that stage but really SpaceX is kind of definitely the leader in terms of trying to commercialize this and out of choice Blue Origin is pretty much like in stealth mode and effectively just kind of doing its own thing. Uh, Richard Branson uh, is in a hurry because he says he wants to put his mother who I believe is 93 years old on the first flight. So his hurry is 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 is, is real too because he wants to, he wants to do that and he might yeah, get in the flight himself. Uh, yeah, no, I think he said he's going to be certainly among the first customers, and and they again saying maybe next year might be the time. But and we'll see. and not unlike uh, um, uh, Tesla, they they have uh, managed to secure a lot of that business with deposits, or some of that business with big deposits yeah. from some of their future uh, 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 astronauts, if you will. Yeah, it's actually been enormously popular. You've just got members of the general public, normally pretty wealthy, putting down you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. A bit like yeah, with Tesla's sort of deposits for kind of future models, and then they've been using that to sort of fund the kind of uh, get, getting the operation up and running. And I, and I checked uh, Eve Branson, Sir Richard's mother is in fact ninety three years. It's a good innings. Yes, yeah, she is indeed. Tom Metcalf, good to see you. Good Thanks see you. so much. Uh, Bloomberg to Tom Metcalf. All right, we're coming up. Uh, big tech companies have long used the nineteen ninety six law to shield themselves from what their users post online. But that could change if some people in Congress have their way. We're going to talk about that story next. If you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Check out my show on the radio, Bloomberg Markets. You can check it out on Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The Senate Intelligence Committee interview with Donald Trump Jr. is being delayed. The panel wants to talk to others who attended the meeting first. Jared Kushner and former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort have been interviewed. Syria informed diplomats in Germany attending U.N. climate negotiations that it will sign the Paris Agreement. This means the U.S. is now the only country to withhold support for the climate accord. The U.S. can officially leave the pact in 2020. The anti-corruption crackdown in Saudi Arabia is expanding. The kingdom's central bank is ordering lenders to freeze hundreds of people's accounts linked to the investigation. In Brussels, former Catalan president Carles Puigdemont addressed a group of visiting mayors from Catalonia vowing to defeat the Spanish government's, quote, repression of Catalonia's independence at the ballot box next month. Puigdemont fled to Brussels after the regional government and parliament were dismissed. And the first country to give women the vote now wants to close the gender pay gap. New Zealand's new prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, says her government plans to achieve pay equity for women in public service within four years. Ardern's labor government swept to power last month. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in Washington, 6.30 in the morning now in Hong Kong. We are joined by Bloomberg's David Inglis with a look at the markets. David, good morning to you. A very good morning. Yep, it's it's dark and early here in Hong Kong. A few things we're watching uh, across markets right now. Let me just get started with the currency markets because certainly we're, we're coming into the Asian se session uh, with a dollar recovering. So we're essentially back to levels of this time yesterday in Asia. Euros below 116, dollar yen 114. Aussies closer to 76 cents. We have a bunch of data coming through in the Asia Pacific. We have China trade uh, on top of every 
thing else basically that we're tracking here in the Asia Pacific. About 70 companies have reported, are either reporting earnings or have reported, so we'll continue to track that. As you can see, it's a soft start to the trading session in New Zealand, seven-tenths of one percent lower. And when you look at futures, we're essentially looking for a pause here after that strong rally that we had on Tuesday. And just keep in mind, of course, you know, there's been some strong momentum coming through in the equity session here that, you know, a lot of these benchmarks are either at multi decade or record highs overbought in some cases so pause for thought as we make our way into this trading session in the asia pacific i'm david ingles here in hong kong more from bloomberg technology next This is Bloomberg Technology, and I'm Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang. Well, for years now, a crack on a big tech uh, ran into a wall, a wall called the 1960s, uh, sorry, 1996 Communications Decency Act. It kept internet companies from being held legally liable for the content their users post on the websites. But that may be about to change. Check what Diane Feinstein had to say about it. You bear this responsibility. You've created these platforms, and now they are being misused. And you have to be the ones to do something about it. I'm joining me to talk about this existential threat to big technology. It's Bloomberg's Josh Brustein. Josh, good to see you. Um, Thanks for having me. This is, this is a big deal. Because you know it, this was seen as a sort of forward-looking thing, saying let's have the same laws as publishers, let's open up the, this, this world so people can, uh, aren't, aren't, so companies didn't have to be responsible, and you could let this thing flourish, the internet flourish. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you um, hear D uh, Senator Feinstein saying things like you're responsible for this content, that's actually not been the case up until this point. And if we see some real action in that way, it could really change the economy of the internet. What, what likely change could happen? Well, the problem with, uh, from big tech's perspective, the problem with being responsible for content is they, there's too much content for them to watch as it goes up. So it would really be a, a policing nightmare. The reason the senators are bringing this up, obviously, has to do with the questions about Russian interference. Well, there's no the question. Election. There was Russian interference in the yeah. election, right? At this point, there's no question about it. Um, it would seem, so I would disagree with that, that statement and say that big companies can't afford it. Facebook mm -hmm. and Google, you know, Google has to monitor on YouTube which songs are being used and pay rights out to those song right owners. So on some level, they're managing this kind of thing. But what it might actually hurt are smaller companies who might actually lack the resources. Google and Facebook are not lacking lacking resources in any way. But bigger, smaller companies and startup companies uh, are. Right, that's always a tension in, um, in these tech policy questions where Google and Facebook are in a good position really to handle any increases in regulatory costs, but tech as a whole would be uh, in a much more complicated position. So we'll see exactly how this plays out. The sort of first battle in, um, in this has actually had nothing to do with the Russian interference. It's come via a sex trafficking law right. uh, where um, uh, advocates for sex trafficking victims want a law that would make it easier to go after platforms that enable sex trafficking. And, and there are some platforms that have, that have targeted these things, of course. Then we've got the whole issue of the dark web, where we've had everything from the Dread Private Ro uh, Pirate Roberts to all sorts of uh, illegal activity of guns and, and, and human trafficking and, and, and drugs and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what, ha what happened this week, or actually last week, was that um, the Internet Association, the trade group for uh, the big tech companies, dropped its opposition to this bill that would um, put more of an onus on tech platforms to, um, to watch for sex Why? trafficking. Why oh, did just, they... just for the sex trafficking part of the business. Yeah, but just for the, the sex yeah. trafficking part of it. They, they dropped their opposition. It, it's largely interpreted uh, as just the general atmosphere has turned uh, against tech, and they've really been fighting that bill hard and thought maybe this isn't the hill we want to die on. It, you know, it, as, as we think about what happened with the Russian, the fake news, uh, 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 where there were intent, where Russians, uh, uh, from what we understand, and, and their, their agents, um, uh, in creatively figured out the things that would really push buttons in the U.S. election and cause chaos and lead people to vote uh, uh, with their, their, their worst intentions and bring people to do that. The other thing that happened is people retweeted that stuff. And it initially might not have been seen by so many people, but the retweets, it would seem that the very least they could do is 
tell someone you were retreating fake news during the election or you were putting this thing out on Facebook so that maybe people would have the responsibility. But these, but it seems like the, the Internet companies have been reluctant to talk about the ways that their services work to amplify uh, news and amplify uh, ideas. Yeah, absolutely. They don't want to... They don't want to claim responsibility for what's going on in the platform. They would really like this to be seen as kind of a conversation that we are facilitating, have at it, and you know we'll provide the tools behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it, the the efforts of you know it seems like the the information has come out, particularly for Facebook and dribs and drabs, where they said, you know, we we only a certain number of people saw these, and then the number got bigger, and we did, they wouldn't share the content for a long time, saying they couldn't, and then eventually they could. But it seems like they didn't really want to talk about how their service worked. I, I, and again, I think that people who retweeted, retweeted this stuff or, or reposted this stuff bear some responsibility here. And I, I'm sure that Facebook could, if they know how many impressions were garnered, then they know who was doing this. Yeah. It, the one thing, as, as you say, it came out in dribs and drabs. You kind of have to wonder if they were going to have this conversation, maybe it would have been better to just put everything on the table at first, take your hit and have a conversation about it. Instead, we've had this conversation over and over with each consecutive uh, revelation. And we've got another election day today in the U.S., so uh, not as big a deal as we'll have uh, with a congressional election in a year, but uh, uh, certainly these issues aren't going away. Josh, really thank you. Josh Bush, thank you from Bloomberg. Thank you very much. We're going to hear from Arm Holdings CEO Simon Seegers as we get his M &A, take on the M&A landscape on the microchip market. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Well, back in July, British chipmaker Arm Holdings was purchased by SoftBank for $32 billion. A big price, yes, but... Arms technology can be found in 85% of the smartphones on the market. Simon Seeger is the Arms Holdings CEO. Joined Bloomberg Television earlier from the Web Summit in Lisbon and talked about the company's relationship with SoftBank and M&A in the chip business. This is a, a huge deal uh, for the industry. Consolidation's been going on in the semiconductor space for quite some time, you know, driven by cost pressures, driven by uh, the R&D intensity of producing uh, advanced devices, and, and this would be a huge transformational deal for the industry. Do you think it would get past the regulators? Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's really my place to comment on that. It's, there's obviously a lot of complexity to it, uh, and it's probably got a long way to go. But, uh, you know, that's something really up for uh, Qualcomm and Broadcom to work out between them. Talk to us a little bit about SoftBank, if you would, and your changing relationship. You're on the board of directors now. Would you consider yourself still a UK company? Mm -hmm. Now, Arm really is a, a global company. We're headquartered in the UK and the largest portion of our employees are based in the UK. Uh, but we've got 5,500 people in the company. We're spread all around the world. Uh, and that's because the semiconductor industry is spread all around the world. So we have people in places where they can work with our, our partners closely uh, in the right time zone, speaking the right language. Uh, and we have engineering R&D centers uh, around the world where we can attract the best talent. So we're a global company, but we're headquartered in the UK. Uh, I would have said that in answer to this question before the acquisition by SoftBank, uh, and it's still true today. Yes, but will it be true in the next few months? Months, though, because it looks like the talks are flailing right now, and it, I know you've spoken in the past about your concerns for a hard Brexit. Now that the US is talking about lowering tax rates and the UK is mired in Brexit talks, there must be some thinking going on about moving your domicile at least. Um, I mean, we, we've looked at the various issues that affect us as a business. Uh, primarily, it's about uh, being able to attract talent. Um, the UK is our headquarters. As I said, we've got a, a large portion of our employees there, and we've benefited greatly by being able to employ people from all across mainland Europe. Um, our expectation is that that is going to get harder as a result of Brexit, um, but you know, we're not planning on making any fundamental shifts in moving out of the UK, moving any of our IP out of the UK. We've done analysis on that. Uh, didn't, doesn't look like there'd be any real benefit to that anyway. Um, so, you know, I think we'll, we'll stay roughly in the shape that we are now. AI and web security, big theme at the summit. Uh, and I know you do see risks to businesses mm. posed by artificial intelligence. What are those risks? 
Well, really, we, we're looking at, uh, at a world of opportunity that comes from AI. Uh, we're heading into a world where um, sensors distributed um, from uh, chips that are going to be anywhere and everywhere uh, is going to generate just a, a mass amount of data. And then uh, with uh, computing spread through networks, computing in the cloud, computing in the edge, uh, there's the ability to analyze that and gain real insight. Uh, and that leads us to a world of AI. I think there's big opportunities there. But with billions of more and trillions, maybe, of connected devices, there are some real potential security risks there. Uh, and I think it's incumbent across uh, the whole industry uh, uh, to really think about that, to think about how the world of computing is going to be very different in the future uh, from what it's been in the past, and that we need to rethink security models because the threats could grow exponentially and the costs associated with it uh, could grow exponentially as well. Simon, it sounds like that's the area you might be looking at acquisition targets in. Obviously, you have SoftBank's backing, so you've got a little wider purse strings. Give us an idea of where you're looking for targets. Um, so uh, throughout our, our history, we've looked at acquisitions as a way of uh, accelerating our strategy. We are looking at this world of um, super distributed computing. Uh, we're looking at how we manage these tiny computers that will make up the Internet of Things. Uh, and we're looking at uh, acquisitions that will help us deliver a platform so that remotely distributed devices can be managed through their lifetime and can have their security uh, observed and monitored uh, and um, action can be taken if there is a security issue. Um, over the last year, we've acquired about four companies. Um, we've brought in technology that's allowed us to uh, develop um, connectivity to the Internet of Things, uh, put identities on chip, all of which are helping solve those security problems. And if we can see um, other targets out there that are going to help us uh, uh, deliver on this technology roadmap, uh, then we'll look to bring them in-house as well. Do you have a blank check from SoftBank? We know SoftBank is a highly acquisitive company. It's had money to spend. It isn't afraid of spending that money. What sort of sums could you spend? I mean, is there a big deal in the offing? Would you have the money from SoftBank to do that? A, a, a sort of a 10, 20, 30 billion pound deal? I mean, we, we really don't talk it, about it in terms of magnitude. I mean, Arm uh, has, you know, just as Arm, um, a standalone company, a uh, pretty reasonable amount of cash on a balance sheet, over a billion pounds. Um, and we've always had the ability to uh, go and raise more if we wanted to for big acquisitions. Um, you know, from my, all my dialogue with Massa, it's about moving fast. It's not being constrained. Uh, and if there was something big that we wanted to do, um, I'm pretty sure we'd be able to find a way to finance that. That was Simon Seeger as Arm Holdings CEO earlier today on Bloomberg TV. Well, coming up, DraftKings is moving beyond its betting platform and getting into deals streaming big time sports. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Well, sports betting giant DraftKings will start streaming top-level European professional basketball this winter. The move brings them into competition with Twitter, Facebook, and Yahoo, and a slew of smaller online competitors, all vying for the attention of cord-cutting sports fans. The CEO of DraftKings, Jason Robbins, talked to us from the Lisbon Web Summit. He sees big money in transforming DraftKings into a one-stop shop for sports. To really anticipate what the customer wants and provide it for them. And what we hear from our customers is that they would like to be able to experience everything in one place, that sometimes it's hard for them to track down where they watch the games, where they play the fantasy sports games, and having it all in one place makes it easier. So the idea here was to say, look, there's a sport that maybe many of you are familiar with but haven't played before. We have millions of customers, and many of them play basketball, NBA basketball, and DraftKings, but none of them really uh, play any other basketball ball sports that I'm aware of on the fantasy side, and if they do, it's quite rare. Um, but there's no reason why. I think the biggest reason why it hasn't happened is because they can't watch the game so easily. So this is hopefully going to fix that and get all the millions of people playing on DraftKings to try out EuroLeague. Do you think it will bring in a stream of new users? I know that in the past there was a big focus on advertising, but you've said that there doesn't need to be that focus anymore. Is this kind of 
diversifying the offering a way to bring in new users? So, I mean, that's possible. I think the main goal is really to try to get the existing users to adopt the game and play it. Uh, but there might also be a benefit of new users coming in. The thing is, in, in uh, order to play, well, you can watch one game for free every week. But in order to watch more games, you have to be playing on DraftKings. So it's really meant for the people who are playing the fantasy sports games. And hopefully that'll get some new people to try it out that hadn't before. Is your expectation that there will be uh, a significant boost to revenue, or this is just an early stage of the project at the moment? I think this is really the earliest stage, and what we love about EuroLeague is they're innovative, they like to experiment, they want to try something with a, a company that's looking to blaze new trails. I think that when you look at where the future is going to be in terms of sport, everyone's already streaming, uh, everyone's already playing fantasy sports, why not have them in the same place? And I think in general, all of the experiences related to media and gaming are going to be in the same place and more seamlessly accessible to customers. We're trying to prove that out and show that it actually enhances the customer experience, increases engagement, increases revenue, increases participation in new sports. I think if we can demonstrate that, there'll be other sports that'll be eager to work with us in the same way. And that was my next question, that if it is a success with basketball, are there any other sports in the pipeline, perhaps a league outside of the US that you want to bring to that US audience? What's your current thinking with that? I think there's many leagues internationally that are quite popular that would be interested in gaining a U.S. audience. Um, you know, football, obviously, as we call in the U.S., soccer is the most popular sport in the world. But in the U.S., many of the leagues that are well known in Europe and elsewhere, people don't follow as much. And I think part of it is accessibility of the games. I also think that in the U.S., there's many broadcasters who've invested tremendous amounts of money and rights, and they're now creating subscription and streaming packages, and they're looking for different ways to distribute their product. We have the customers that they Want. So they would be hopefully interested in partnering with us. And again, if we can prove out that this works, I think anyone who owns the rights, whether it's the leagues themselves or those that have invested in buying the streaming rights, they'll all be interested in working with us. This seems to be one example of DraftKings' uh, recent sort of commitment to new media, original content um, <clears throat> beyond the existing fantasy sports platform. And I know that a lot of that recently is focused on talent hiring. Could we see some more partnerships with content creators, with uh, perhaps non-fancy sport platforms to build up that new media off offering, that original content offering? Absolutely. I think that is going to be a big focus for us, and you will see more partnerships with content creators and also those who own content rights. Um, you know, there's this, it's inarguable that there's a link between fantasy sports and content consumption. Every stat you see shows that fantasy sports players want to consume a lot of sports content, and I think it stands to reason if you make it easier and more accessible for them, then they'll want even more of it. And DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins also talked to Bloomberg about his company's plans for global expansion. I think you'll see us expand into more Europe. Australia is a very interesting market that we've started spending a lot of time focused on, and I think that could be one that you'll see us. Um, we've started preliminarily looking at Asia and Latin America. We're still in the early stages of evaluating those opportunities. To date, we've done more work on Europe and Australia, but I think they're very interesting. And even Africa, there's fantasy sports being played throughout many, many parts of Africa. Um, it's a worldwide phenomenon, and I think it's a matter of how quickly we can get everywhere and which countries to go into first, but eventually we'd like to be everywhere in the world. A part of accessing new markets is, of course, understanding and complying with regulation. And in the US, you've been real leaders um, in not just discussing regulation, but trying to push it forward um, in terms of consumer protections and things like that. How difficult is it to do that? I mean, not just to push for regulation, but when you're looking at new markets, understand it, comply with it, and you know, present a business case for going there with that in mind? Well, you know, it just takes time. Um, but what we found is that most of the regulators around the world They've been very much willing to look at this in a different way and say, what does the customer want and how do we get it to them? And people around the world want to play fantasy sports, whether they call them manager games, as they do in many parts of the world, or fantasy sports, they want to play them. Um, more recently, you mentioned the Maltese license in January. That was a great example of where we worked with a regulator to create a completely new set of licensing, never had licensed controlled skill games before, and dozens of operators within weeks applied for those licenses. So I think it showed it was really a thing that there was pent up need for and they've been great and that allowed us to expand through different parts of the EU so far. And as part of that initiative you brought on a, a new chief legal officer in Stanton Dodge um, who had a lot of experience in his, in his previous role. 
when you hired him, you said that part of that was about breaking into new markets. What was the thinking about needing to bring someone like that in? Well, if you look at what he and, um, you know, of course, Charlie Oregon at DISH did, uh, they did the same thing we're trying to do. They created new industries that came with new regulations. They had to work with lawmakers. They had to focus on how do I both innovate at the same time and educate regulators and lawmakers so that that innovation is possible. And I love the way that he and I think all great people in this space look at it. They say, how do we allow the business to move forward and innovate? How do we create a road and uh, a path to do that? And um, He's proven it. He's done it for decades at DISH, and I think that he's pretty excited about it, and we're pretty excited about having him do it at DraftKings. That was a very excited DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins talking to Bloomberg at the Web Summit in Lisbon. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder that we are live streaming on Twitter right now. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 o'clock in the East Coast, 2 o'clock in the West Coast. That's it for now. This is from New York. This is Bloomberg.